The Secret to Achieving Personal Goals A Simple Guide to Transforming Inner Resistance into Personal Power Introduction We pursue personal goals because we want to make our lives better. New goals bring a powerful flow of positive energy and enthusiasm. The problem is that this positive energy does not always last. Often it gets blocked. The challenges of achieving personal goals is in large part the process of dealing with these energy blocks. These blocks are at the root of the ups and downs that we all experience in life. The secret to achieving personal goals explains how to transform the inner resistance we face into the wisdom and strength we need to achieve our vital goals and create the life we most deeply desire. The key to overcoming blocks is found in a secret that is hidden within your consciousness. It is a powerful secret that is neither mysterious nor obscure the fact is that there are successes and personal highs hidden in your present and past that you do not fully acknowledge or appreciate. In fact, it is very likely that you have forgotten many of them. The secret to achieving personal goals will show you that the key to making changes in your life is not by focusing on negative past experiences, but by awakening the joy of your neglected positive experiences. By reclaiming forgotten and unacknowledged peak states, you will connect to the source of your personal power. Then you can achieve your life's true purpose in the genuine state of freedom and joy. The secret to achieving personal goals will show you that the path to accomplishing this is a natural and simple one. You are invited to come, be of good courage, and join me. The greater the challenge, the greater the reward. Saying of the Philosophers. Chapter 1. The Nature of the Challenge. A Story. After many years of training and practice and counseling, I, discover, I discovered something that is universal to the process of overcoming blocks to success. The insight is that we generally fail to fully acknowledge and appreciate the steps and the progress we make towards our goals. In fact, we often forget key successes and personal highs along the way. This forgetting is the key to understanding our blocks. The point is essential for understanding the deeper secret I'm going to reveal. For one, as you will see, this pattern of forgetting positive states reveals why we get blocked and why inner resistance to personal achievement occurs. Secondly, from a very practical perspective, if we forget positive states and successes, our lives will lose their meaning and we will be unable to achieve our goals. Any time a person is blocked on the path to achieving a goal, be assured that he or she has failed to acknowledge their own progress in one of the following ways. Unfairly judging his or her own efforts negatively, or minimizing and neglecting the importance of steps, no matter how small, that progress toward the goal. As you shall see in the following story, the simple fact is a doorway to understanding the inner workings of our life. Mike is a friend of mine who has come to me for counseling over the years. He is one of the brightest and most talented people I know. Mike has some difficulties finishing things he starts, and he considers himself to be a flake. One evening, Mike called me up and said that he needed to speak to me, urgently. He came in a half hour late and did not look himself. My joyful and carefree, carefree friend, who usually starts every conversation with a joke, was in a panic and filled with stress. It was upsetting to see. I'm ready to quit my job, he told me, and leave my wife and take off. I just can't take it anymore. He then went on to relate his problems, both at work and at home. He described how he was fed up with his job. It wasn't what he wanted to do. He also described how his boss was mistreating him and he didn't want to put up with it anymore. He then went on to describe his dissatisfaction with his relationship with his wife. I listened and then asked some questions about other aspects of his life. To my surprise, I learned a very interesting thing. Mike was on the verge of completing two of his most important life goals. In the next few weeks, he needed to complete one term paper to get his Bachelor's of Arts degree. And he had also been invited to take his black belt exam in martial arts. Both of these goals had deep significance. Mike had been working on the degree for many years. He had been two classes short, and he put the degree off for a few years. Now, now it was all but finished. The other goal was equally meaningful. Mike was the private student of a master of an ancient and little-known school of Kung Fu. 
He had been studying diligently for six years, driving a far distance to his classes many times a week, and getting up early to practice. Now he was to become one of the teacher's first black belts, a great accomplishment for him and his teacher. Everything was going great for Mike, and yet one would never have known that from this state of mind, Mike and I spoke together about the profound importance of this particular time in his life. If he could hang on in for a few more weeks, Mike's entire self-image would be changed forever. This self-proclaimed flake would become an expert in Kung Fu and a college graduate. So why was Mike in such a negative state of mind? You could call it fear of success, but it was much deeper. The stress that he was experiencing was immense. All the, negative, all the negativity stored up in his psyche was coming out in a full force attack to try to convince him that he couldn't do it, that he couldn't and shouldn't achieve his goals. The power that speaks out against us in our attempts to improve our lives, I call the inner adversary. When we approach success, the inner adversary gets down to his business, and for a special reason. If Mike does complete these goals, the inner adversary will lose a great deal of power over him. The inner adversary gets its power from the negative images and feelings we have stored in our minds. When we accomplish successes, we have the opportunity to transform those negative images and beliefs into positive ones. To the degree we defeat the inner adversary, we also free ourselves from inner resistance. Mike and I spent some time exploring and discovering the origins of some of these negative beliefs and feelings. Facing the Christ together in the special way that you will learn in the later chapters helped Mike gain some remarkable personal insight. I am happy to share with you that Mike went on to complete both goals with true excellence. Some main points. Mike's story is a valuable example because it illustrates so clearly key principles that are fundamental patterns that arise when anyone seeks to achieve a goal. 1. For the problem and crisis to occur, Mike had to forget his success. You cannot have a problem if you are aware that you are in the middle of a successful progress. As long as you remain conscious of your progress and success, you cannot be in a negative state. Negative states arise in proportion to the degree we forget our success. I'll repeat that. Negative states arise in proportion to the degree we forget our successes. 2. What Mike thought was his problem was not his problem. Mike was troubled about his work and his marriage. He was feeling dissatisfied with his life, but as we learned, these feelings were deceptive. They had nothing to do with the real issue in his life. In a problem state, we blame ourselves, others, and our situation. Mike blamed his wife, his boss, his lousy job, and also himself. I'm a procrastinator. I'm lazy. I'm a flake. Statements of blame are always false. It may be true that we function in our lives in less than ideal ways, but emotionally charged blame statements reveal the working of the inner adversary. Number three, Mike's problem and crisis occurred as he progressed in his goal and approached success. It was not a failure that led to Mike's crisis. It was the success he was creating. It was a success for Mike to be one step away from his degree and to get the invitation to take his black belt test. Every goal has many steps, and each step we take is a success. Problems and crises occur not from failure, but as responses to successes. And I'll repeat that one again too. Problems and crises occur not from failure, but as responses to successes. Number four, the crisis point is an opportunity for profound personal discovery. When we reach the crisis and enter into the negative state, we gain a valuable opportunity to discover and free ourselves from the false beliefs and negative self-images. Number five, we gain positive change and growth when we stick to our goals. The only way to solidify insight and free ourselves from false beliefs and negative self-images is by challenging them through action. When we stick to goals and accomplish what we desire, we prove these false beliefs and images wrong and we dissipate the energy of the inner adversary. Mike's story is not unique, and the lessons here are universal. Nearly all human problems can be explored in the context of goals and blocks to achievement. My colleagues and I have seen the principles described here applied successfully in thousands of instances and in all kinds of challenges that people face. 
pursuing a goal can be broken down in a few parts in a sample chart. The chart says energy cycles for pursuing a goal. Number one, the aha stage, set a goal. The number two stage, progress as you pursue your goal. Number three, facing the energy block or facing a difficulty. This has two possibilities. It can lead to quitting, or the second possibility is a breakthrough that continues the progress to finally, number five, achieving the goal. The stage where progress is blocked by a difficulty is the pivotal moment. Understanding the dynamics of pursuing goals is essential to health and personal growth. Goals provide the energy of our lives. When we channel that energy towards the goal, we grow. When that energy, when that flow of energy is blocked, or when we quit the goal, that energy gets trapped within us and causes physical and psychological health problems. The primary insight of this book is that the blocks and negative energy that arise in the pursuit of a goal do not come as a consequence of failures, but because of our progress and the potential of success. The biggest human problem is not the actual failure to achieve what we desire. That is, the things that we blame ourselves and others for. The real issue is the refusal to acknowledge successes. But the question is, why? The idea may sound puzzling at first, because we usually attribute the cause of negative energy to our problems and limitations. Things we blame ourselves for, such as, I'm a loser, I'm a procrastinator, I'm no good, etc., but the truth you shall learn in the following pages is that these blaming statements are the expression of our inner adversary with its army of negative self-images defending themselves against the potential of success and change. The lesson we must learn is not to believe these negative feelings and thoughts, but to confront them, learn from them, and gain strength from the battle. You shall see that despite its opposition, ultimately the inner adversary serves a beneficial purpose to help us grow. Without opposition, there would be no necessity for us to become stronger. The nature of the challenge. We all set goals and we all face the challenge of achieving our goals. The simple question is, why is it at times so difficult? Why do we encounter such inner resistance to achieving what we most deeply desire? The secret to achieving our personal goals is found in understanding the mystery of this inner resistance. The presence of inner resistance reveals the importance of a goal and the potential it brings for good in our lives. Let us begin by first looking at what is at stake in the pursuit of a personal goal. We pursue our goals because they are desirable to us. If something is good, then it radiates with the light of a particular event benefit. We exercise because we desire greater strength. We strive to break bad habits, like smoking and unhealthy eating, because we want to improve our lives. We go to school because we seek successful careers and the livelihood to build our personal lives and families. We practice music and other arts because we seek the joy of artistic expression. Therefore we take on the challenge of achieving a specific goal in order to bring the light of that benefit into our lives. Whenever we pursue goals, we inevitably face challenges. By confronting these challenges, we have the opportunity to achieve a second kind of benefit. We discover the hidden strength and self-knowledge necessary to overcome the personal challenges. When we overcome our limits and break through barriers, we also gain a deeper appreciation of our individual lives and the beauty of life itself. There exists, however, a voice and a power within our psyches that resists the awakening of this beautiful and beneficial light in our lives. This voice expresses itself within our minds in many ways and feelings. It can, it can arise silently in feelings of tension, fear, anxiety, and frustration. It also can speak in statements of fear, doubt, discouragement, self-criticism, and blame. It interprets our worldly challenges to be permanent barriers that make success impossible. Sometimes it speaks in very subtle arguments and says, You're okay the way you are. You don't need to take on this challenge, this higher goal. In short, it argues in every possible way to persuade us to abandon our desire for a better life. 
I call this power the inner adversary. So what advice is generally given against the resistance of the inner adversary? The advice often expressed is, build the willpower to overcome the inner resistance. Although willpower is necessary for personal development, and it certainly succeeds up to a point, willpower is often insufficient by itself to meet the greater challenges. This is because willpower alone is like having an army without a general. A big army without intelligent leadership can win smaller battles, but when it comes to the big battle, it will rarely, rarely be victorious. What, after all, is the reason for this resistance to achieving good things? It is very difficult to fight in a resistance when we do not understand why it arises in the first place or what the battle is truly about. On the face of it, it doesn't make sense. We desire good things, but at the same time, part of us resists achieving them. Why do our own minds pull us in two completely different directions? Moreover, since this resistance comes from our own minds, it is often a source for continued self-criticism and blame, which further strengthens the resistance to growth. The danger is that the inner adversary will persuade us to abandon our goals and the vital benefits that the pursuit of personal growth brings. We can gain tremendous hope and strength for the battle by discovering the truth of the inner struggle for our personal goals and the nature of the inner adversary we must confront. In the following chapters, we will learn the secrets of how the inner adversary works. You will discover this adversary ultimately works against us to make us stronger. However, in order to gain the strength, we need to learn the inner workings of the drama we face on the path to success. And one of the main points we can learn from this chapter is that the inner dynamics of the struggles we all face are very similar. And the self-criticism the self-criticism that we often hear in our own minds, we attribute to ourselves. And we think it's particular to ourself. The point we're trying to bring out in this chapter is that this is an objective reality that all of us face in the struggle. It's a game. We're all involved in the same game, and everyone experiences the same kind of experiences. And when we can look at our own lives objectively, then we can begin to let go of that self-criticism and the personal emotions that are associated with that. Our aspiration is the key to our inspiration. We are not judged by what we have achieved, but by where it is we are going. A quote by Rabbi Abner Weiss. Chapter 2, Goals. There is an old riddle that asks, what is both the loudest thing in the world and the quietest thing at the same time? The answer is a thought. A thought is the quietest thing because it makes no sound, and yet you can hear a thought above the loudest sound. Thoughts are the expression of ideas, and they are not only the loudest, but also the most powerful things in the world. Ideas ignite people, individuals, communities, corporations, nations. They are the source of all movement and action. Have you got an inspiration that has sent a burst of energy through your body as if you were struck by lightning? Eureka! Out of nowhere you realize you want to learn the piano, start a new business, lose weight, maybe take an art class. Whatever the particular, it is a goal that excites you and brings your energy into your life. In those initial moments, there is an excitement, and when you reflect on the idea, it generates more energy and excitement. The thought of taking on this new goal has so, so much energy behind it that it is like a steam engine loaded with coal sending your heart pounding. Turning the idea over and over in your mind fuels the fire of the racing engine. Where does this energy and power come from? And why is it so powerful? Ideas carry this energy and power because they are the, they are the seeds of creation. Contrary to what we ordinarily think about the world, the truth is that the world is created through ideas. In the human realm, this is obvious. How do buildings, monuments, technology, corporations, countries, how do they all get built? All of these creations originate in ideas. Talented people with skill and creativity come up with ideas and designs, and from those designs and plans, things are made. An architect had to design the Empire State Building, and the founding fathers had to write the Constitution, 
in order to establish the United States. Both are, in essence, ideas. And it is no different in nature. Every part of nature can be reduced to an idea, a mathematical idea that defines the structure of its molecular, atomic, and subatomic structure. In the organic realm, each cell of a living organism is created from a genetic code written out in the combinations of the 22 proteins called amino acids that form the building blocks of DNA. Interestingly enough, according to the Kabbalah, the universe was created when God arranged the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet, which are said to be the ultimate elements of creation. According to Genesis, God creates through these letters and words, which are God's ideas. Creating your life is no different. It begins with ideas. Su success begins with a flash of vision. This vision is your inspiration and a gift for your life. When you receive this inspiration and energy, you are tapping into the power of creation. This inspiration is the beginning of an opportunity to transform the world in an important way. When you consciously choose a goal and aim to bring it into the world, you are becoming a co-creator of the world. Creation is happening all the time. It did not just happen at one point at the beginning. It happens every moment. The remarkable thing is that human beings were created to be free creatures. We are the only beings in the universe that actually have freedom. Plants and animals do not have freedom. They follow what they are supposed to do in the universe. Plants follow physical laws. For, for example, they grow towards the sun. Animals follow their instincts. Among spiritual beings, it is taught that even angels do not possess freedom. They merely express their spiritual function in the universe according to the will of the Creator. It is only humans that have freedom. Therefore, it is only human beings that are able to participate in the continuous process of creating the universe. Life's Essential Questions In life, we are all faced with the same set of questions. What are my goals? What are my most important goals? How do I achieve them? Why do I experience so much internal and external resistance along the way? How do I transform the resistance into positive energy? How do my goals fit into the bigger picture of my life and destiny? How do I achieve peace and harmony with the grander truth of life? It is no accident that we are all faced with these questions. These questions constitute the central part of your life's journey. In a very important way, goals are a window to the soul. Your goals define your values and your interests. Equally, they are a measure of what you want to achieve in life and how far you have gotten. It is for that reason that sometimes goals can be scary. All too often we think about desirable goals and are immediately faced with self-doubt. Sometimes people conclude that it is better not to take on goals because it could lead to disappointment and frustration. It is actually the other way around. I heard a Los Angeles rabbi named Abner Weiss once say, Our aspiration is the key to our inspiration. We are not judged by what we have achieved, but by to where it is we are going. This line expresses a key message of this book. Taking on goals, whether we achieve them or not, is the key, is the key to connecting to our life's energy. Moreover, the ultimate judgment from above is not concerned with what we have achieved, but our courage and our faith to strive for what it is that is in our heart. It is only natural that this is the case. The Creator placed our destiny and our highest vision within the recesses of our heart, and it is our task to discover it. Thus, when we are true to our hearts, we can follow the path on which we can gain the greatest good and do the greatest good both for ourselves and for the world around us. Your Destiny When contemplating your goals, it is natural to wonder, what is my destiny? What is my life's purpose? There are a few important principles to keep in mind as you take on these questions. First, the destiny does not have to mean becoming a famous actor, politician, musician, athlete, or artist. A profound destiny means reaching your full potential as a human being to exercise your talents and contributions for yourself and the world around you. In today's world, the goal of building a healthy family and career is both a rare and noble achievement. Very few of the famous people in our world are able to accomplish this goal. Even the most famous and successful people who have achieved both kinds of goals would agree that to become a centered, loving, and healthy person with a family is the most truly satisfying goal that any person can achieve. 
Each of us has certain talents, gifts, and qualities within our soul, and it is our life's challenge to cultivate these potential potentialities and bring them successfully into the world. The way to discover your potential is by awakening your heart's true goals and aspirations. Indeed, this is the true meaning of destiny. Destiny is not something that is fated or determined, like being good at math. It is a potential power that you must exercise in order to overcome your limitations and achieve your freedom. You will learn powerful tools for making this breakthrough in the following chapters, as well as hearing stories about the kinds of insight it takes to succeed on this journey. One final point to remember is that your heart's desire does not have to be the means by which you make your, by the way you make your living. Building a family and career are the foundation of your life, and these choices often have to be made very pragmatically. This foundation can provide you with the opportunity to pursue an art, sport, music, or other pursuits that you can enjoy simply for its own sake and for the challenge of bringing forth a potential within your soul. So let's finish this section with a story. It is one of the most beloved Hasidic tales. Reb Zushia constantly brooded over his concern about what would happen to him in the afterlife. I am not worried, he told his disciples, that I will be asked to explain why in my lifetime I was not an Abraham or a Moses or a great sage like Maimonides. I am terribly worried that when I get to the other world, I will be asked to explain why in my lifetime I was not simply Reb Zushia. This tale can be easily translated into contemporary life. We often compare ourselves to the famous and successful, but the person of integrity does not brood over becoming a Gil Bill Gates or Madonna or Michael Jordan. He or she is concerned that when his life is over, he will be sure to have lived a life that was a complete and beautiful expression of his or herself. We all at one time or another in our lives have wished we were great like someone we admire. What this tale illustrates is that the most important thing in life is not to be great like someone else, but to live up to being most truly oneself. This teaches, teaches us that one of the highest ideals in life is sincerity. With sincerity, we are able to face our own limitations and honestly strive to be better by bringing forth the best in ourselves. In that spirit, we do not have to strive to achieve the goals of this or that great individual or family member, but merely to reflect sincerely upon our own lives and open to, up to the genuine inspiration that flows through our own souls. For as, Reb, for as Reb Zushia teaches, this is what heaven asks of us. Choosing your goals. Every goal, no matter how big or small, is significant and offers tremendous potential for learning. We often fret over what our goals should be. We think, is this particular goal really what I want to do? The most important thing, however, is not necessarily to pick the perfect goal, but just to start on the path of consciously pursuing goals. Sometimes the only way to discover if something is the right goal is by working towards it and giving it a try. These efforts are never in vain because we will always learn something about ourselves in the process and gain cr greater clarity about the future. Some people are experienced goal setters and some are not, but everyone has goals, whether we are aware of them or not. If we feel like we don't have goals, there is usually a reason why. Sometimes we avoid goals because we fear, fear failure or because we fear choosing the wrong goal. At other times, it is the opposite reason. We fear the implications of pursuing our true goals. We might even fear success. We must trust that a destiny is the birthright of every human being. It may take a little time and reflection to discover your higher goals, but know that everyone has them. In the meantime, if you are not clear on your larger goals, you can focus on your immediate and practical goals, which are equally effective in this process of personal growth. To make this process of choosing a goal a little easier, you can consider the following chart. Most personal goals fall into one or more of the following categories. Pick the area you would like to focus on. This is the first step in clarifying your goals and values. One category could be health, such as diet, exercise, stopping smoking, eating healthier, starting yoga, breaking an unhealthy habit. Another goal, another category is the professional. Examples would be changing jobs, improving work performance, gaining greater degrees or certificates, starting a business. 
Another category is educational, such as personal development and professional development. Or it could be personal interests, creative writing, art, musical instrument, dance, sports, travel. Then there's the category of relationships. We can have the goal of improving our relationship or just finding the ideal relationship, of building a family, or improving our existing family life. Another category is the spiritual. That would include goals of meditation, other kinds of yoga, self-improvement, good deeds, extending greater kindness and compassion, and also strengthening one's prayer. Then there are other practical, personal goals, such as organizing your affairs, breaking a bad habit, cleaning the house, writing a letter you've put off, taking care of bills, legal, legal matters, etc. You might find it valuable at this time to consider some of your past goals, immediate and long-term goals within each category. Write them down and you can be as thorough or as brief as you wish. If you are only interested in one category, then focus on that. These categories give you a range of options. For the purpose of the work in this book, it is important that you choose a goal that you would like to begin working on and which can serve as the focus of exploration in the next chapters. A pattern is a sign of order. In seeing order, we discover meaning, and where there is meaning, there is intelligence and wisdom. Dr. Pierre Grimes. Chapter 3, Charting Your Energy Cycles. Journaling. The goal you have chosen in the previous chapter may be one that you have sought to achieve in the past. It also may be one that you are planning to pursue in the future. In both cases, it is essential to learn the art of charting your energy cycles. When we, pursue a go when we pursue goals and proceed on the pathway from inspiration to success, we will inevitably encounter various ups and downs along the way. This is natural, for nothing in the physical world stays the same. Motion is the essence of life. These ups and downs form the basis of our energy cycles. The study of energy cycles is the key to gaining profound insight into oneself and the wisdom to na navigate through the obstacles to success. In order to facilitate our self-study, it is especially helpful to keep a gold journal. Dedicate a notebook that you can use for this purpose. Keeping a journal will have three main purposes. 1. To log your efforts. Number 2. To reflect on states of mind as we pursue our goals, noting both highs and lows, negative and positive states, as well as any transitional thoughts, fantasies, or distracting thoughts. Number 3 to write down reflections and thoughts about the journey. Our plan is our commitment to ourselves and to the goal. Therefore, we need to monitor how well we stick to the plan. In other words, we have to be our own manager. However, the point is not to praise ourselves for what we do well or for our good efforts, nor is it to get down on ourselves for the times when we slack off. The goal is to study ourselves in order to discover insights about the patterns that go on as we pursue our goals. We should note how much time we put into our goals and pay careful attention to the emotional high and low states of mind that arise. We can also try to become aware of the thoughts that both precede and initiate the highs and lows and the positive and negative states of mind that we experience. We need to have an objective state of mind and become like scientists studying our lives viewing all of our inner thoughts and experiences that accompany the pursuit of our goals as the wealth of experimental data that will reveal deep and profound truths about ourselves. In other words, we must align ourselves with the objective observer in our psyches. This takes some practice. It is not essential or even desirable to become completely detached from one's emotional states. What is required is that we gain a level of objectivity that will allow us to look at our lives from the perspective of clarity and wisdom. We all can do, per, excuse me, we all can and do participate in this wisdom. Our challenge is to maintain this eye of wisdom in the midst of the drama of our lives. Your present goals. There are probably one or two goals that immediately come to your mind. They could be trying to break a habit like smoking 
or the development of a positive habit like exercising regularly. It could even be a major goal like starting a new career path. Please write down a few of these goals and then pick one to be the subject of your current exploration. As you consider the goal, you might be aware of certain negative patterns that interfere with your pursuit of that goal. You may have tried to achieve this goal before and encountered what we call a temporary failure or setback. Or you may be aware of other goals you have sought to achieve and the kinds of blocks that arose to thwart full completion and success. If that is the case, please answer the following questions. What is the past or present goal that you are now thinking about? When you first contemplated the goal, what was it like? Were you inspired in some way? Was this a high state of mind? Please describe. How far did you get in the pursuit of the goal? Describe the stages in your pursuit of the goal. Use as many stages as you need. At what point or stage did you encounter the block? Can you describe the block as you perceive it? By the way, feel free to pause this video to write in your journal if you're doing that as we uh, go through the text. It is accompanied, is it accompanied? One second. Can you describe the block as you perceive it? Is it accompanied by physical feelings of tension? Are there also negative thoughts associated with it? Please write some of those thoughts down. Did you get back and return to the goal? Please explain why or why not. What have you concluded about the goal or yourself as a consequence of this experience? At some point, at some point in the pursuit of your goal, there's going to be resistance. Were you able to identify the resistance you experienced? Is it a feeling or problem state that you experience in other areas of your life? Does it have a long history? Most likely it is related to negative thoughts and feelings of tension in your body that are quite familiar to you and have been a consistent source of frustration and pain in your life. This is a universal phenomenon that you will come to understand and work to resolve in the course of your reflections and self-study in this book. We all experience these kinds of blocks and negative thoughts and feelings in the pursuit of goals. In the next chapter, we shall discuss why we must necessarily encounter negativity in the pursuit of goals and what the cause of that negativity is. Then we shall begin to explain how to, how to transform that negative energy into positive energy and strength. When a fruit grows, the first part of it to grow is the shell or the outer covering. So too, when some fruit, that is, that is something good, comes to the world, its shell precedes it. Rebbe Nachman. Chapter 4. The Inner Adversary, the Source of Negative Energy. The fruit or reward of our inspiration and efforts to achieve a goal is worldly success. Remarkable energy is experienced when we are inspired to take on our personal goals. Inevitably, however, energy blocks will arise before that success comes to full fruition. Ordinarily, we see these blocks as undesirable and bad, but we shall learn in this chapter that like the skin of a piece of fruit, they play a natural and important role in the process of our growth. The skin is a shell that protects the fruit until it fully ripens. Personal blocks are a kind of shell also. They achieve, they actually create a vessel in which success matures and develops. We shall also learn that the greater the struggle against these blocks, the greater the vessel we create to, bo to both receive and protect our success. This insight into the true nature of energy blocks will help us transform negative energy into opportunities for personal enlightenment and achievement. Let us begin with the primary insight of this book. It might sound peculiar at first, but you will understand its meaning after reading this chapter, 
And when you do, it will change the way you look at your life. Negative energy is not the consequence of failures. It is a response to the approach or accomplishment of success. Once again, negative energy is not the consequence of failures. It is a response to the approach or accomplishment of success. What does this mean? Let us take the first part first. Negative energy is not the consequence of failures. Negative energy arises when we feel blocked from something we desire. This state of being blocked is called a problem state. Therefore, let us consider a few examples of how people often state their problems. I can't stay on my diet. I don't have the willpower. I'll never be thin. I need to exercise more, but I'm lazy. I can't get along with my spouse. I'm just not good at relationships. I am bored with my job. I can't get organized. I'm just not an organized person. I'm addicted to smoking or drugs or whatever it may be. I just can't stop. I don't have enough drive or ambition to stick to my goal of whatever that goal is. What is your goal and what is the way you express your problem? Please consider that question for a moment. What is your goal and what is the way you express your problem? As you look through each of these statements, do you see something similar, a common theme? Underlying each statement is a statement of blame. The person who makes one of these statements blames himself for a lack of deficiency in his or her character. For example, if John says, I don't have enough drive or ambition to stick to my goal of becoming a lawyer, then he is blaming his inability to achieve what he desires on his character flaw. People can express similar statements by blaming others. It's my parents' fault that I didn't do more with my life. It's society's fault that I'm stuck in this situation. It's my spouse's fault that the marriage didn't work. It's my boss's fault that I didn't improve my career. Whenever a person makes a statement blaming himself or another, there may be some truth to it. Sometimes there may be a lot of truth. However, such statements of blame do not help individuals or groups move closer to reaching their goals. Blaming puts individuals and groups in a state where they think that they know the truth. Statements that place blame, even when true, generally block real growth and progress. This is because blame statements are an expression of anger. The real truth that we wish to discover is the truth that liberates us from all negative emotions. Even if the blame is true, the most important thing is to discover how to move forward and achieve what you desire. And no matter what the level of obstacle or difficulty, there is a way to make progress and achieve every genuine goal. As Stephen Covey and other great thinkers on personal development have noted, the very way of stating a problem can often be part of the problem itself. Whenever we cast blame upon ourselves or others, we focus on the inability to do something. To the degree we are convinced of the truth of the statement, we will not be able to overcome the problem. Blaming statements become self-fulfilling prophecies of failure. This is common sense. If you think negatively, things are more likely to turn out negatively. The most important thing to realize is that the blame is a dead-end street. It is a statement of where your growth stops. Most blame statements are completely false. If we look again at any of the statements above, especially the ones stating self-blame and deficiencies, we can see that they are false because they make an absolute statement about personal failure. They say, I can't achieve X. The simple truth is that, as humans, we all have the ability to grow and make progress in our lives. Even if that progress is modest, it is still progress and growth. These can't statements block even that modest progress. And modest progress is the beginning of complete success. Worst of all, can't statements cut off hope. In each of the above examples, a positive goal becomes not only a statement of blame, but a statement of blame for a perceived failure. This leaves the person who said it hopeless, 
because the goal is now perceived as impossible. But the real truth is that no situation is hopeless. Therefore, these statements are an expression of something absolutely false. Why is there a resistance to success? Negative energy is not the consequence of failures. The negative energy we experience from what we perceive to be failures is deceptive. The truth is that these statements of failure are statements of blame and hopelessness that block the expression of genuine progress and potential. Moreover, they are self-fulfilling prophecies, because when we say them and believe them, our energy is sapped and we give up our goals as hopeless and impossible. But this is all false. So what is the reason for this universal phenomenon? Let's now explore the other part of this core insight. Negative energy is a response to the approach or accomplishment of success. But why? This seems completely counterintuitive. How could this possibly be the true explanation? Why would we respond to the approach or achievement of success negatively? After all, the goals we want to achieve are generally extremely good and beneficial to our lives. Why would something within us resist the achievement of these good things? The answer is surprisingly simple. Although the resistance and negativity we experience is painful, it ultimately exists for an essential reason, to make us stronger. As my good friend Svi Freeman says on behalf of his teacher, the Lubavitcher Rebbe, in his inspiring book, Bringing Heaven Down to Earth, life's challenges are isometrics for the soul. They force out its inner powers. Isometrics is a kind of exercise where we use the energy of, our, energy of our own body pushing against itself to build muscle strength. For example, you might push your hands against one another to build the strength of your arms. In the same way, life puts the oppos opposition to us in various ways to help us grow. One of those ways we are challenged is by the very resistance we experience within our own minds. Although this force seems like an inner enemy, in truth, it functions like our opposite hand, pushing us to gain in strength. That is why I call it an adversary. The inner adversary is a source of the adversity we experience, but it is not motivated from hate or evil. An adversary is not necessarily an enemy. It is one that functions opposite us. In this case, like an opposing player in a game or like a coach, challenging us to reach new heights. However, when we don't recognize this force in this way, in its worst manifestations, it can appear like an evil enemy torturing us. The key to transforming our negative energy into positive opportunity is to change our, per our perception of the inner struggle we face. It is essential to see our life's challenges in the most positive and beneficial light. We achieve this by gaining an understanding of the purpose and function of the inner adversary. You know, that's so important. I want to repeat it again, please. An adversary is not necessarily an enemy. It is one that functions opposite us. In this case, like an opposing player in a game or like a coach challenging us to reach new heights. However, when we don't recognize this force in this way, in its worst manifestations, it can appear like an evil enemy torturing us. The key to transforming our negative energy into positive opportunity is to change our perception of this inner struggle we face. It is essential to see our life's challenges in the most positive and beneficial light. We achieve this by gaining an understanding of the purpose and function of the inner adversary. The inner adversary blocks the way to success for two beneficial reasons. First, a goal is not worth anything unless it requires a significant challenge to achieve it. Second, it is through overcoming challenges and resistance that we bring forth our inner strength and power. In fact, the very challenge and resistance becomes the source of our strength. Signs of success. The most astonishing aspect of this insight is the idea that negativity and struggle are actually signs of success. But let us explain this more specifically. Consider the example of Joan, who is overweight and is struggling to maintain her diet, not only for her appearance, but also for the sake of her health. Joan begins her diet with a very positive state. 
she has the inspiration and image of her new self in mind and feels a tremendous amount of energy. She makes a plan and commits to it. She achieves emotional harmony and physical energy and completes three perfect days. On the fourth day, Joan begins slipping, and the fifth day is a disaster. She goes to a party and has two pieces of chocolate cake in a corner when no one is looking. She comes home and cries to herself and says, I can't stay on my diet. I don't have the willpower. I'll never be thin. She feels like a miserable failure. Needless to say, she loses all her positive energy and erroneously concludes that her dream of being thin and healthy is hopeless. It may sound strange to say that this is a sign of success. What I've just described is a typical example of a failure. Indeed, it appears like a failure, but the real issue... Indeed, it appears like a failure, but the real issue is what is the true cause of the failure. If we examine the dynamics of what occurred with Joan, we discover something fascinating. The fact is that Joan was successful on her diet for three days. Three days is not the entire goal, but it is an expression of success. On those days, Joan was sticking to plan and achieving her goal, period. We need to consider how she felt on those days. Day one, Joan was cautious wondering if she would be able to do it, to go on the diet. Day two, there was a struggle. She fought hard against her desires and won. Day three, she felt great. Joan felt strong. She felt good about herself and confident that this time around, she was going to succeed on her diet. Day four, Joan was feeling good about herself, having a great time at the party. When she saw the chocolate cake, a thought arose in her mind that said, Joan, you shouldn't deprive yourself. You'll go back on the diet tomorrow. Day five, Joan fell weak, a failure, remorse, and that the goal was impossible. The real key to this entire dynamic is, of course, day four and the thought, Joan, you shouldn't deprive yourself. You'll go, on the back, you'll go back on the diet tomorrow. A number of questions arise. Where did the thought come from? Why did it come? Why did Joan listen to it? And why did listening to the thought lead to such a negative state on day five? At this point, I'm going to answer th these questions very simply. As you proceed through the rest of the book, you will have the chance to explore the dynamics that arise in your own pursuit of success, and then we shall go into greater detail to help you generate important insights for your life. This thought comes from the inner adversary, the inner adversary is a part of our psyche that functions as an adversary to challenge and test us. Although there are deeper psychological and metaphysical reasons that you may wish to explore in your religious life, the basic purpose is what we explained earlier, to make us stronger. The thought comes at this critical point on day four, because Joan is still experiencing the energy and success of day three. This is when the inner adversary is going to test us when we are strong and feeling positive. If you think about it, when we are feeling down, we do not face the ki these kinds of tests. This is quite an interesting point to reflect upon. Joan listened to the voice because the inner adversary uses words, thoughts, and expressions that come from the teachings of her family, teachings that were false, but which she accepted as true. The same is true for all of us. And that is why Joan, and each of us, goes through a drama from high to low energy. We play out dramas in our present life which reflect important aspects of our childhood. We shall explain in the next chapter exactly how this works. For now it is important to understand that even though these kinds of dramas are difficult and painful, they ultimately have very profound and life-affirming lessons to give us. When we discover these lessons, we also recapture the full potential of our lives joy and power to achieve our true goals. The power of deception. The lesson we should learn from the example of Joan is that it is not the pain or difficulty that we face that is the inner adversary's greatest force against us. Its greatest power is the power of deception. If we were always aware that it was simply pain and sweat blocking us from success, then things would be relatively easy. The biggest problem we face is that we are deceived and then convinced to give up our goals for reasons that we are convinced are true. Joan is convinced that she should not deprive herself of the cake at that critical moment at the party. Once Joan succumbs to that persuasion, the inner adversary convinces her that there's a reason on day five why she cannot reach her goal. 
This is when she places the blame upon herself. This is the ultimate power of the inner adversary's deception. It persuades us to blame ourselves for our blocks when its deception is the true cause of the negative cycle. This is the inner adversary's function, to convince us that we can't reach what we want to achieve. It is a perfect system of deception. If we are convinced that we can't, if we are convinced that we can't, then we won't. If we think that we can, but it is just difficult, very often we will rise to the occasion. That is the beauty of the human spirit. That is why this powerful enemy seeks to undermine our spirit, because that is the greatest challenge it can give us. Goal-directed personal growth will give you the tools and the strength to help you realize the nature of the deception, the lie of can't, so you can discover that you can achieve what you desire. It is your destiny to do so. Now we can also understand why it is that people express problems as blame statements and of lack of deficiencies. Excuse, once again, now we can also understand why it is that people express problems as blame and statements of lack or deficiencies. The I can't. In each of the examples we spoke of above, the statements actually are ways of avoiding the challenges of success. I can't stay on my diet, for example. Every time a person goes on a diet, he or she is successful for some period of time. The problem or failure to stay on the diet is actually a response to the experience of being successful in the diet and the implications of that success. The same is true for all the other examples. I need to exercise more, but I am lazy. I can't get along with my spouse. I'm bored with my job. I can't get organized. I'm addicted. I don't have enough drive or ambition to stick to a certain goal. In each of these cases, the essential issue is the success, not the failure. Once again, negative energy is not the consequence of failures. It is a response to the approach or accomplishment of success. In fact, we can go to a deeper level and state, negative energy is a consequence of being deceived. Every success is followed by a test. And unless we are aware of this test, we will be deceived by the inner adversary. It is this deception that leads to negative states. There are various tests that we are given. These tests offer us the opportunity to gain different strengths. Most often these tests concern issues regarding powers we have given up from our past and childhood. These tests, however, very often go unnoticed because they employ language and beliefs that we have accepted as true from our family belief systems. These beliefs form the operating systems of our lives, and like a computer's operating system, they are often hidden from our view. To pass the test and progress to the next level of our development, we need to discover these hidden falsehoods that we have accepted. This is the subject of the next chapter. A problem is that which can be solved. Euclid, the ancient Greek geometer. Chapter 5, The Anatomy of a Breakthrough, Goal-Directed Problem Solving. If you or someone you know has gone through a healing journey, then you know that the process of healing is often quite simple. By healing, I do not mean a medical cure through drugs and therapy, but a discovery of the inner power to heal the body or soul. The journey is sometimes long, complex, painful, and very difficult, but the breakthrough the moment of awakening and healing can be quick, surprisingly simple, and remarkably effective. The future of healing in all areas will be based on methods that have been demonstrated to support this process. In the previous chapter, we explained that, the, that most tests that we face as we approach success concern powers we have given up from our pasts in childhood. My mentor in personal growth counseling, Dr. Pierre Grimes, has spent 40 years studying this phenomenon and has brought to light the very way in which these tests occur and also how to approach them and gain their potential gifts. According to Grimes, problems in this specific contest text have a reality and significance only in respect to goals. Continuing from our examples in the previous chapter, this would mean that laziness, lack of willpower, not being organized, bad at relationships, having an addiction, etc., are not problems 
in themselves. They are only problems when this feeling or belief blocks a person from achieving a specific goal. The definition of a problem follows the original meaning of the word's Greek origin, something that can be solved. For example, a problem in Greek mathematics must be solvable. If it is not, then it is a logical paradox. When problems are explored in relationship to goals, they can be solved. If they are not examined in relationship to goals, they cannot truly be solved. Let's look at the example of Joan again. If Joan says she is feeling down and depressed, she does not have a problem. She just doesn't feel good. She is merely describing a negative state of mind. However, if Joan says that she wants to lose weight and yet believes that she can't because her lack of willpower will prevent her from achieving the goal, then we can say that she has a problem as we are defining the term according to Dr. Grimes. A problem statement generally describes a feeling state and thought that makes the achievement of the goal seem impossible. This failure to define problems in relation to goals is part of the reason why many people are often dissatisfied or confused by some kinds of therapy. We often hear people saying that they don't know how long therapy will be required or how to judge if it has been successful or not. A goal directed approach to personal growth offers a solution for many who seek this kind of development. Goals provide the very standard for determining when a problem is solved. Joan knows if the counseling or therapy is successful if she is able to go back to her goal and achieve significantly more than she could before the counseling. And most importantly, Joan doesn't have to rely on an expert to evaluate her growth because she can see and judge the results for herself. If she has more willpower and is able to follow her diet and lose the weight as she desires, then clearly the counseling was successful. The pursuit of goals, therefore, is the context where problems are solved and the condition for profound insight to be discovered. The anatomy of a breakthrough. There is an order behind the chaos of our lives. Although much of human life often seems to be a terrible mess, there is structure to it all. Dr. Pierre Grimes has discovered this structure and has revealed that there is an intelligence that functions even within the chaos of human problems. Dr. Grimes has worked with thousands of people in problem states and has articulated a system of questioning that leads individuals to discover the belief system that forms the operating system that creates negative cycles. It reveals that what seems chaotic in our lives is actually completely in control. Although it sounds paradoxical, the real problem is that we are not aware of our own control. This is because we are not aware of our inner operating system. This goal-directed approach can lead you to a breakthrough where you discover the dysfunctional operating system. This discovery then often leads to a moment of genuine freedom where we gain the opportunity to regain the powers that we have given up in childhood, the very powers that define our full potential and true destiny. In this section, we shall present an anatomy of the path to a breakthrough, continuing with our example of Joan. The path of questioning is an adaptation of Dr. Grimes' method. Joan has the power of losing weight. Excuse me, Joan has the goal of losing weight. She also has a diet and exercise plan to achieve her goal. However, Joan has now encountered a block. A goal-directed approach to, to gaining a breakthrough follows the following path of exploration and questioning. Joan's example continued. Number one, what is your goal to lose 20 pounds? Number two, what is your plan, diet and exercise schedule? Number three, what is your block? I don't have the willpower to stay on the diet. We accept the problem statement as it is, even though we recognize it as a blame statement. This is not the time to point it out. Instead, we bring forth all the information. The next step is to draw out the energy chart of the problem in the present. Number four, draw out the energy cycle. Day one, Joan was cautious, wondering if she would be able to do it. Day two was a struggle. She fought hard against her desires and won. Day three, felt great. Joan felt strong. She felt good about herself and confident that this time around she was going to succeed on her diet. Day four, Joan was feeling good about herself, having a great time at the party when she saw the chocolate cake. A thought arose in her mind that said, Joan, you shouldn't deprive yourself. 
You'll go back on the diet tomorrow. Day five. Joan felt weak, a failure, remorse, and the goal impossible. She tries to go back to the diet but says, I can't, I don't have the willpower. In step five, we evaluate the energy cycle. What is the critical turning point in the energy flow? What is the key thought or feeling that precedes downturn in energy? When Joan comes to explore the issue, she is focused on day five. This is the stage of self-blame that most people get stuck in. And this is what the inner adversary wants, because by sticking there, we stay in a negative state of mind and are unlikely to get insight into our lives. By looking critically at the energy cycle, we can discover a more interesting stage to focus our reflections upon. Day four. A number of things stand out about that day. We see that Joan's, Joan's strength increases up to day four. We also see that on day four, she is faced with another test, the party. This time, however, she fails. The inner adversary says, you shouldn't deprive yourself. Number six, does this voice or do these words arise in other areas of your life? Can you identify the pattern you are seeing in your life in general? In other words, can you identify the pattern you are seeing in this example also in your life in general? At that point, Joan says, my goodness, this happens to me all the time. I feel like I shouldn't deprive myself, and then I end up doing things that harm me. This happens when I try to budget my money, my time, and my relationships, and it leads me into actions that turn out to be harmful, but somehow I can't stop myself. At this point, Joan really has identified the issue in her life. It is not about diets. She is seeing that it concerns a more general theme in her life that occurs in many areas. Joan sees the general pattern. Number seven, can you chart an energy cycle for how this pattern arises in other areas of your life? Joan then could chart an energy cycle in other areas, trying to restrict her spending or end a relationship. She will then see the same dynamics occur. A. I want to make a change. For example, end a relationship. Curb spending. B. I commit to a plan. C. I make an initial success. D. Then I reach a point where I feel good about myself. E. The voice arises. You shouldn't deprive yourself. And then I give in. F. When I feel miserable, then I feel miserable about myself. I have no willpower and I'm a failure. Step eight. Why does this thought have such power over your life? Now Joan can explore an essential question in her life. Why does the thought you shouldn't deprive yourself have such power to deceive her? The most interesting thing at this point is that Joan will have tremendous difficulty in acknowledging that this voice is false. Even though she sees it leads to harm, she also feels that it is the absolute truth. And when asked, she responds, but I shouldn't deprive myself. She is in a paradoxical state. She does see the harmful pattern, yet she feels that the voice is expressing an absolute truth. That is why there is a problem. She believes something that is deceiving her, and she cannot challenge that belief. The exploration of her past reveals why this occurs. Step 9. Can you describe the state of mind that you experience when this powerful thought or feeling arises? Joan is now asked to consider how she feels when she hears the voice say, you shouldn't deprive yourself. Her answer is, I am feeling deprived and that's not a good feeling. And that's why the voice is so appealing. It gets me out of that bad feeling. When asked to describe that feeling, Joan says, it is awful. I feel terrible tension in my throat and I feel unloved, terribly unloved. I feel a heartache in my chest. Step 10. Does a memory from your childhood come to mind? Let's chart it. Yes, I'm playing the piano. I must be five years old. I just learned my first song and I played it for my mom. I feel a great sense of accomplishment, but my mom doesn't acknowledge it. She starts yelling at me, yelling at me for not cleaning up. I tell her, I did clean up and she sends me to my room. I am feeling unloved and down, deprived. Then mom comes in later and hugs me and tells me she loves me. Stage one, I'm feeling great, a sense of accomplishment. Stage two, mom doesn't acknowledge my accomplishment, unfairly criticizes me, then sends me to my room. Stage three, I get upset and down, I feel unloved, I feel deprived, I go to my room. Stage four, 
Mom comes in and shows love to me. I feel good again. Step 11. Compare with the present. If we compare the past scene and the present scene, we can discover a lot of parallels and similarities. The theme of de feeling deprived is key. In the past, Joan is deprived of mom's acknowledgement and love. In the present, she is playing this theme out in respect to her goals. 12. Evaluate past scene. What is really going on? It is clear that these past scenes somehow shape Joan's psyche. She repeats patterns in her present that center on the theme of deprived and loved. In order to discover why this is, Joan needs to gain a major insight into the significance of this past scene. She needs to understand what is really going on in her family dynamics. Grimes points out that it is not so significant how, how these scenes actually happened historically. It's how we remember them that affects our lives. Therefore, we do not have to be sure about the historical accuracy. It's our memory that counts. The significance and meaning of these past scenes has shaped us, and the truth of the power of the scenes is locked within our minds and memories. The keys to unlocking this mystery are the following. Number one, sticking to present goals, facing and confronting negativity. Number two, intensely questioning the scenes from different angles. Number three, meditating on your questions and seeking deep answers from within. A couple of lines of questioning are key to bringing forth the insight. In the past scene, did you see something that you thought was unfair? Did you express it? Why or why not? What would have happened if you did? In Joan's scene, can we identify what was unfair? Joan had a success at the piano, but mom refused to acknowledge it. Instead, mom used that positive moment Joan was enjoying to criticize her. It would be important for Joan to consider whether mom did acknowledge her successes in general. In Joan's case, mom did not. Consequently, the key issue for Joan is, why is it that mom doesn't acknowledge my successes? Was there something positive about the scene? Was this a way of relating and showing love? Why was this your family's model of showing love and care? Joan realizes that mom only showed affection after sending her to her room and when no one else was around, like dad. Expressions of love were not allowed around dad. He would get jealous. Mom showed love, but why couldn't she show love by acknowledging the accomplishment? Was the family threatened in some way by Joan's positive state of mind or accomplishment? Why? Joan sees that success is a state of positive energy, joy, vitality, and that was an allowed expression in the house. In fact, that was a major theme in her home, to not express love openly. What is the significance of the key theme? How does that relate to a family teaching? Aha! Joan realizes that mom used to complain that she was deprived of love from her father, and that made her mother very distraught and miserable and she would tell Joan not to ever end up with someone who would deprive her of what she needed. Are you following that family teaching today? Are you also playing out that family drama on yourself, taking on multiple roles? Oh my, Joan says, I am seeing the restrictions I place on myself to achieve a diet or budget as a form of being deprived, and I am breaking my limits because I am listening to the voice that says, don't deprive yourself. That's my mother's voice, and the restrictions are like my father, and the whole thing is a way of re reliving this scene in the past where I'd have accomplishments and then be put down by my mother. So why are you f playing out this family drama? The inner adversary brings forth the voice that says, don't deprive yourself. This voice is persuasive and gets Joan to give up her goal. We each have such a voice in our own lives. So why does this occur? Have you ever noticed how joyful and full of energy children are? It is astounding. So what happens to humans as they become adults? The plain truth is that most families cannot accept so much positive energy. This is because we are filled with restrictive beliefs that limit our ability to be both positive and see the world with clarity. Just consider when you are feeling down, depressed, frustrated, or angry about something, what is it like to be with someone who is free of all care and filled with joyful bliss? Would you, would you agree that it is generally hard to endure? Children of both clarity and pure positive energy. 
In order for children to adapt to the limitations of the family psyche and family dynamics, their energy also has to be limited and restricted. Otherwise, they will never fit in and become part of the family. Parents react to this positive energy, not consciously, but almost mechanically. They react instinctively to children's positive states at certain key times in their children's lives as opportunities to introduce the family's limiting belief structure. The most remarkable aspect of Dr. Grimes' work is that he has de demonstrated how aware children are at very early ages of the truths of the family structure. The joyful clarity of a child's mind allows them to see with great precision the way in which the family is challenging the positive state that he or she enjoys. When this challenge occurs, the child generally does not stand up for himself because the challenge centers around an essential aspect of the family belief structure. In Joan's case, she has just finished her first song at the piano. She is jubilant and proud. At this key point, mom challenges her about her chores. Joan has the option to ask mom about her accomplishment at the piano, but she doesn't. At five, five years old, she realizes that people don't get acknowledgement and praise in the house. To ask for acknowledgement would invite an attack. Therefore, she gives up her positive state of mind and takes on a negative state of mind, mom's state, feeling deprived. By taking on this negative feeling and belief, she actually becomes part of the family. She can now share a key experience and state with mom and dad and her brothers and sisters. She can now share a key experience and state with mom, dad, and her brothers and sisters. The motion between feeling good and feeling deprived is the key to the drama of each of their individual lives and the family dynamic. For Joan and for all of us, there's a re is, there is really no alternative. If she maintains her positive state and refuses the negative one, she is ignored and exiled by the family. By taking on the negative feeling state and going to her room, she later receives mom's love in the way mom is able to express it. If she remains in the positive state, she will be deprived of love altogether. In her present life, Joan is living in the same structure. If she remains in the positive state of achieving her goals, her psyche tells her she will be deprived of love because that is what she experienced in the family. By breaking the diet, she also breaks the power of feeling deprived and also plays out the next stage of her cycle. She goes from accomplishment to feeling miserable, and she plays her mom's role on herself, criticizing herself for her failure. In the present, however, there is always dissatisfaction because the goal is not achieved, and a frustration about why this pattern occurs continuously and thwarts her from her plans. But even this negative pattern serves a positive purpose. The similarity between present and past exists because the inner adversary wants us to ultimately turn back to the past and regain the joy and vitality we had given up as children. This is what the inner adversary is challenging us to do. As a child, Joan consciously gave up the positive state for a negative one because she understood that this was the way to truly become part of the family and survive in the family structure. Now as an adult, However, she has the freedom to reclaim the positive power she has given up and discard the negative and false way of being she has taken on. At this point, it is essential to recognize the role of love in these scenes. When an individual like Joan goes through such an exploration, she discovers that many of the restricting feelings and frustrations in her life are the direct result of past scenes where family belief system and dynamic closed down her positive states. It is very easy to go from self-blame to blame of parents. However, there is a much deeper understanding of the reality of our lives. The truth is that each of us is limited by belief structures, including our parents, for they suffer from the same problems as we do. If they knew how much their actions caused us to suffer, they certainly would not have acted the way they did. By looking carefully at our past, we can discover that what motivates such scenes as Jones is love. In these moments, parents try to share with children what they think they know is best. The problem is that when they think what they think they know is a false and sick belief. 
However, the transmission and receiving of the sickness is done through love. When we realize this as adults, we have the remarkable and precious opportunity to reject what is false and focus our appreciation and love on the beneficent, beneficent intentions of our parents or other family members. This shift is a sign of maturity and is also essential for our own well-being and liberation. Anger binds us to the past, whereas love and joy free us to live in the present. In truth, it is difficult to break these patterns. In her example with Joan, she faces a critical moment when the inner adversary says, don't deprive yourself. If Joan ignores that voice and maintains her quality of strength, she rises to a higher level of functioning in her life, and she also rejects the family drama. The inner adversary convinces us that to reject the family drama is to reject the family. We often conclude in our innermost selves that it is better to accept a lesser way of functioning in our lives in order to preserve our commitment to our family. However, this is a false choice. As we stated previously in the beginning chapter, our family structures are like the shell of a fruit that protects us. But at certain time, the fruit must ripen and the shell must be discarded. We must never reject our families because their intentions are always benevolent, even when their actions are not. We must learn to honor our families while also rejecting their limitations. The challenge that this presents to us cannot be underestimated, nor can its re rewards. What is true for Joan is true of all of us. Our original state is one of joy and vitality, purity and positive energy. This wonderful positive energy can be restored and our true nature liberated. When a person goes through this process, it awakens an amazing energy and awareness. It is a way of reconnecting to the true depths of our original and pure nature. It is literally a form of personal enlightenment. For some, this path can take many years. Other may be prepared to go through it very quickly. Each person's pace will be different. Go at the pace you feel comfortable. The most important thing is that you honestly reflect on your experience and cult cultivate the courage to continue on the path of growth. Remember that the inner adversary will also attempt to block you from doing this work, so you can use the blocks that you experience in this chapter as the subject of your explorations. The way to do this is by following the same line of questioning as in Joan's example in the previous chapter. Please use your journal. There are also blank pages for your notes at the end of the book. Stage 1. Exploring Present Patterns and Blocks What is your goal? What is your plan to achieve the goal? Draw out the energy cycle you experience as you pursue this goal. Write out these current scenes and cycles in detail. After writing the details, you will need to refine your analysis. First, divide the cycle into its key stages, as if it were a drama from a movie or play. Try to focus on the essential points that determine the highs and lows. Review the examples from Chapter 6 and also Chapter 3 to discover how these scenes are analyzed. See if you can see a similar pattern in scenes from your life. Usually when we start a goal, we experience a kind of high, an initial enthusiasm for achieving what is desired. Did you experience that feeling? This stage is often followed by first efforts. Did you reach this point? Was it a positive and good state of mind? At some point, negative feelings or thoughts may have arisen. Are you aware when the first negative thoughts or feelings arose? If so, be sure to mark it down. When did they occur? Were they in response to certain thoughts or activities? Be as specific as possible. Do you experience resistance to achieving your goal? Do you experience a certain kind of block? Please describe your problem as you understand it. Focus on the stage where the negativity begins and you are blocked. Draw a model of the state in as much detail as possible. Here's an example. We see a stick figure with an unhappy face. He has tension in his throat. He's choked. He says to himself, I'll never be able to do it. I'm a loser. I feel like a failure. Can you describe the physical tensions that you experience? Are there thoughts and feelings that seem to generate this state of mind? 
Can you describe what this state of mind is like? For example, it is like I am a failure or I am stuck between a rock and a hard place. Can you identify the main theme of this scene? Can you name the state? What would you call it? Then what happens? How long do you stay in this state? How does this present scene resolve itself? Do you get back to the goal? Do you quit? Do you find something else to do? At this point, reflect, reflect on the following questions and see if any important memories arise. If so, try to write them on a paper or speak them into a tape recorder. Please feel free to pause this video and review these questions at your own pace. Evaluate energy chart. What is the critical turning point in the energy flow? What is the key thought or feeling that precedes the downturn in energy? Does this voice arise in other areas of your life? Can you identify the pattern you are seeing in your life in general? Can you make an energy chart for how this pattern arises in other areas of your life? Follow the same procedure as often as you wish to gain insight into other scenes in your recent history. Why does this thought have such power over your life? Can you describe the state of mind that you experience when this powerful thought or feeling arises? Do any memories from your childhood come to mind? Record them on paper or into a tape recorder. Stage two, picturing the ideal. The key to breaking free of your particular problem and limits is fairly simple. We've begun to look at the negative state. Now I would like you to identify the positive state. In the pursuit of every goal, there is a state of mind or a state of being that we ideally seek to express. This state can be associated with an ideal that is of central importance to you and what you experience and express in the world. It may be that this ideal is very far from your present experience, but nonetheless, please identify it. Some examples of ideals are strength, joy, confidence, caring, love, balance. The key is that it is a state that escapes you. In your peak states, you get a taste of it, but somehow this state appears to elude you, and it may even be a trigger for inner resistance and blocks. It may also seem that to maintain this state seems impossible for you. If you can identify such an ideal and block, then you have reached an important and critical point in your development. So, what is your ideal? Please write it down. What can you accomplish? How does it feel to be in that ideal state? How do you see the world? How does the world see you? How would this state change your life? Be as specific as possible. Now please draw a stick figure of yourself in this positive state, this ideal and fill in your description as clearly as possible. As an example, we have a stick figure of a young lady shining with the ideal of confidence, strength, and determination. Underneath is the bold letters, success. This is the ideal that Joan has from our previous chapter. Please draw out your ideal picture of success. Now that you have a clear picture of this state, the key is to be attentive to the forces, feelings, and thoughts that arise to prevent you from living in this ideal way. It is quite understandable if you feel a great deal of fear and trepidation. This is because you are now asking yourself to cultivate a state of being that was rejected by your family and literally exiled from your expression in your childhood home. Therefore, all the fears that led you to abandon this positive state in the past will now arise again in the attempt to block you from reclaiming this ideal in your present. It may seem odd, but the fact that we experience these same fears and blocks 
is a sign of the quality of justice in life. The fact that these same blocks, feelings, and negative thoughts arise in our present gives us an opportunity to reject what we should have rejected in the past, but couldn't because of our respect for the authority figures in our lives. It is because these same feelings arise that we also are given the opportunity to explore important memories from the past. These feelings and thoughts are triggers for the precise memories that will help us gain clarity and insight into the formation of our psyches. They give us the opportunity to recall positive and peak states which we have forgotten and to reject those scenes and moments when we took on a false way of thinking and being. These moments of reflection and exploration can be fearful, but if you have drawn out a picture of the significance of this ideal, you also know how vital it is to your life and to the achievement of your destiny. At this point, we seek to go back into our world at the appropriate time and with the conscious knowledge of our ideal, we try to express it, it we try to express it in our everyday lives. We do this by sticking to our goals in the face of resistance. We try our best to enter positive or ideal states, and then we know what happens. There will be resistance, and that is okay, because the resistance will also help clarify our understanding of our blocks. By confronting the resistance and the blocks, we are literally trying to force the inner adversary to reveal himself. We then stand up to him and ask him to express himself and tell us exactly why he is opposing us and why. If in these attempts all that we experience are feelings of negativity, then we ask the adversary directly and see if we can get a response. We try to enter into those feelings and get them to express themselves. Usually they will. We also have the opportunity to contemplate our ideal in all its beauty and splendor. The picture we have drawn of the ideal can be used as a personal vision, and this vision is a source of strength. We can use it to generate positive energy to stick to our goals and defeat inner resistance. Many, many people get to this point in these explorations and gain tremendous insight. Often our lives are a chaotic jumble of worries and fears. We don't seem to know why or where negative thoughts and feelings come from. When we pursue specific goals, we gain focus. Then when we draw the energy cycles we experience, we can discover patterns. Patterns bring tremendous clarity because they reveal when and why certain negative states occur. Patterns also reveal that our blocks are not dependent on external factors, but instead result from intern internal causes. We can see firsthand that when we reach certain positive states of successes, that is, when we approach our ideal, then the eternal in internal negativity begins. Once we see this, we can gain some control over our mental life. Without this awareness, control is nearly impossible. With this awareness and realization, we can also discover that what we blame ourselves for is simply incorrect. We can see for ourselves that our blocks arise not because of the things we blame ourselves for, but as a response to positive steps towards our goals. I am not lazy because of a personal character flaw. I take on this state because it is a pattern I learned from the past. When I start achieving my goals, like keeping my house clean, I, I reach my ideal of order and calmness, a state that did not fit in my family. It may be difficult to experience blocks, but it is a relief to see why they arise. Imagine having physical pain that no one can explain, a headache or stomach ache. This is very frightening. What could be wrong with me? In the face of the unknown, we often fear, fear the worst. What a great relief it would be to discover that the physical pain we're experiencing is a direct, a direct result of some recent exercise we tried or a positive change we made in our diet. This means that the pains are not the result of something bad. They're actually the sign of something good. In fact, the first step in any cleansing of the body is the release of toxins. 
And this stage is always painful. The same is true for your inner life. In the context of pursuing goals, you can discover that the pain you feel from personal blocks is a sign of potential progress, not a sign of illness. This realization itself is liberating. Stage three in our process, returning to the goal. In stage three, we, turn, we return to the goals in our present life and discover what impact our deepening awareness has on our ability to confront the inner adversary and the negativity we face. <clears throat> you may very well experience resistance as you begin your work towards your goal. You may even experience greater resistance. Do not be turned aside by this. Use this as an opportunity to learn more. Be like a scientist exploring your inner life, as I, as I described in the chapter called Energy Cycles. It often happens that the greatest resistance surrenders and becomes the greatest joy and fulfillment. I have often found that when I am faced with a difficult block, if I bear down and just do it, I am able to enter into my work, enjoy my efforts, and later on remember with surprise at how difficult it was to begin. If you learn how your pattern of resistance works, and you are then able to continue with your efforts in the face of it, you will diminish its power over you. You will see that you can succeed in spite of the inner, in spite of the inner adversary's efforts. In this way, you will become stronger, and in truth, this is the ultimate purpose of the inner adversary. This is the isometrics that I described earlier. When you work against the resistance, your soul becomes stronger. You discover that you are stronger than the adversary. You can understand what he is up to and beat him. The insights you gain into your pattern are very helpful in this process because they reveal how he works. If you see firsthand in your own life that the negativity you experience arises as a result of your progress and success, what are you going to do? When you experience a block or negative thought, are you going to give up? If you give up, then just exactly what it is, what is it that you are giving up? Aren't you giving up your success? If you know this, then you know that you can no longer give in to the negativity that seeks to stop you on your path to achieving your goals. So what should you do? The first thing is to note in your journal, what is the negative feeling or thought? Record, what, record when it occurs and what was happening before that in your goal-directed efforts. It is likely that before the negativity arose, you were making some degree of progress or positive actions towards the goal. And it doesn't matter how much progress. The only thing that matters is that it was a positive effort. If you can recall this, then return your mind to the place where it was, where, where it was when you were working. This was probably a pure state free of all or most of the negativity. You can regain the state by returning to your positive actions and efforts towards the goal. A second method you may try is directly challenging the negative thought and feeling. Every negative thought you experience is a charge against you, like a charge or an indictment in a court of law. To the degree you accept that negative thought its negativity gains power over you. The way to avoid this is to directly reject and refute its charge. The charge may be, you're lazy. Well, you need to answer that charge. But beware, don't get into a debate or discussion. Just forcefully reject what it says as false. I am not lazy. Don't evaluate these negative charges about your past. All that matters is the present. If you continue with your plan to achieve your goal as best you can, then any charge that your inner adversary makes against you is false. And don't let the inner adversary say that your efforts must follow your plan perfectly, because they don't. We are all human, and that means we have to allow for good efforts. There is a famous expression that says, do you want to make God laugh? then make plans. God laughs when we think we can or have to keep perfectly to a plan. This kind of thinking is a setup for the inner adversary to put us down. Human beings are not robots. Make sincere efforts. 
That is what counts. Appreciate your successful efforts and do a little better next time. Sometimes we experience very negative feelings and it is not clear what thought or idea is generating them. There are, there are a number of strategies that can be taken when this happens. You can try to speak to the feeling and ask it to put it into words. This is often very effective and then you can continue with the strategy I just described above. In, in other words, that feeling state, even though it doesn't express itself in a clear statement, we can look directly and invite it to bring forth the statement that we then can use to, to, to uh, uh, review and, and also uh, refute, as we did in the previous paragraph. However, sometimes these negative feelings are stubborn and they remain obscure to us. If the feeling is very painful, sometimes it is quite difficult to continue working towards a goal, even though this is the best possible approach. In this situation, there are a number of alternatives. One is to do something else that is positive and will free your mind from its frustration. If you like to exercise or play a sport, this is often a good way to loosen everything up physically and mentally. It generates good energy that allows for insight. Or if not exercise, do whatever you enjoy doing that generates positive energy. Go out with friends, take a walk, do a hobby, or play music. In these times, there are a number of spiritual activities that are very effective. These times are excellent for prayer and meditation. The path of, the path of growth depends on our ability to gain insight. Insights are achieved through cultivating a quality of receptivity. Meditation is one of the best practices to assist in gaining this quality. Instead of rejecting the pain and frustration encountered by blocks, this negative energy can be used as an invitation to go forward. In meditation, one does not reject the negative state. Instead, you open up to it, and through relaxing the body and mind, and also maintaining a calm focus, you merge with that state. When you do not reject it, you have the opportunity to enter within it, so to speak, and discover the thought or memory that generates the negativity. This then, this then releases remarkable insight. The work we are doing in the secret to achieving personal goals, in confronting the inner adversary and confronting our blocks, inevitably leads to entering into those blocks, sometimes in very challenging ways. This, however, is also a positive opportunity because it's only when we confront the block then are we able to discover the deep insight that allows us to realize the source and root of that block in our lives. But we have to admit that this is a difficult process. And as we reach these critical moments, sometimes it's very important to appeal to other aspects of life in order to in order to help us make those breakthroughs so one of them as we said is meditation so you're encouraged to utilize any kind of meditation that you're familiar or comfortable with and i will also provide a wonderful introduction to meditation at the end of this audiobook the other approach that we can use is prayer a simple form of prayer which is also considered the most powerful by many great spiritual leaders is to speak to God directly in your own words. Go to a private place and speak to God as if he were a friend sitting next to you. Tell him about your life, your goals, your blocks. Ask him for the help that you need. Practice this for however long you feel comfortable. It can be five minutes or an entire hour, but try to do it regularly. And as we know, insight often comes when we take a break from the activity of searching. As we know this from science, many great scientists, when they're searching for an answer, they often report that those answers come after a nap or a freedom from the activity. And it's in those open moments that the insight occurs. So please allow for those opportunities in your own life. We'll move on now to stage four, exploring the past. Very often in these explorations, scenes from childhood arise in our consciousness 
for the reasons I have explained above. It is important to record these memories as they come to you in writing or in a tape recorder. It does not matter if they are the real memory. The essential factor is how you remember these events, for this is what shapes your life. Then go through the events and try to form them into scenes as in a drama, some, similar to the way you have done in the present. Mark the stages of the scenes and include a description of who was present, what was said, and the state of mind, that is, the emotional state of the people involved. Also note who was not there and why. It would be helpful to look at a couple of scenes from the past to see patterns emerge. It is also important to try to find a scene in your early childhood. However, neither is essential. Explore any scene that comes to mind, and these explorations will lead to others. You should go through this process multiple times. When you see its benefits, you will want to make it a regular part of your self-explorations. The following questions are a guide for your explorations. The ultimate goal of these exploration is to reveal the truth of your life's experience. The revealing of truth within one's personal history is a kind of enlightenment experience. In an enlightenment experience, we go beyond what we consciously know and receive a vision of a deeper level of awareness and knowledge of our life. Therefore, in order to fully benefit from this exploration, seek to open yourself up to a level of awareness that is beyond what you know or think about your life. Let these questions be an opportunity for thoughts and insights to emerge naturally from a deeper level of your mind. Meditate on these questions. Let them bother you. Follow your gut feelings and not just your own theories and opinions about your life. Be open to new insight and awareness. Be patient and kind with yourself and let the truth reveal itself. In exploring your past, several lines of questioning are key to bringing forth the insight. In the past scene, were you in a positive state? Did those present generally acknowledge or welcome such states or experiences? Were they supportive of what you valued? Why or why not? What did you think of that? Did you express it? What would have been the implications of expressing it? Does this theme come up in the past scenes you are exploring? What were the family's values? How did you know that these were the family's values? By values, include not only moral or life lessons, but what thoughts, activities, goals, and ways of being were important to each of your parents or authority figures. Be as specific as possible. This is essential. What did you think of those values? Did you express your opinion? What would have been the implications of expressing it? In the past scene, did you see something that you thought was unfair? Did you express it? Why or why not? What would have happened if you did? Was there something positive about the scene? Was this a way of relating and showing love? Why was this your family's model of showing love and care? Even in scenes that are not positive, parents often express values that are important to them. This is a way of expressing love and care. In these past scenes, do your parents or authority figures express such values? Is this a way for them to express that they care? If they did not express these values to you, what would have been the basis of your relationship? Would you have had a way of relating to them? In order to accept this way of relating, did you have to give up a positive state of mind and being? What did you give up? In accepting their model of love, did you accept something about them that you saw then was false and see now is false? Are you following that family teaching today? Are you also playing out the family drama on yourself, perhaps taking on multiple roles? Why are you playing out the family drama today? If you see this, then you also have the opportunity now to reject in your present what you did not reject in your past. You also have the freedom to reclaim the positive qualities and experiences you left behind in the past. And now in the future, you have the opportunity to express them. Was the family threatened in some way by your positive state of mind or accomplishment? Why? Please explain. What is the significance of the key theme? How does that relate to a family teaching? These are very 
profound and deep questions and can be explored over and over again. And each one of them, perhaps you could write a page or, or multiple pages of reflections. We encourage you to look at them and review them as needed. But as you see, this is the general structure of this process. And we'll now move on to stage five, testing what you've learned. The ultimate test of insight is how it affects your life. It is essential that after going through this process of reflection, you return to your goals and see what impact they have. Do the same blocks and problems arise in your life? And if they do, do they have the same power or less power? In this process, there is no guesswork as to whether you have made personal growth or not. We measure our growth by the practical way it changes our lives. True growth is revealed when you return to your goals and you are able to achieve what you could not achieve before. You are able to accomplish more and the negative patterns that you have explored diminish or disappear altogether. No matter how much insight you can gain from personal reflections, growth occurs only when we return to our goal and, and confront the resistance of blocks. The insight you'll gain in this process does not make the blocks instantaneously disappear. In fact, after major insight and when you return to your goals, the resistance may increase temporarily. This is a test of the inner adversary. It is called the counterattack. It is the inner adversary's last attempt to block you. If you are able to maintain the insight you have gained in the face of his opposition, you will completely free yourself from this particular negative block and pattern in your life. Most often after, after gaining insight, a person is able to return to their goals and gain immediate success. The following day, however, the counterattack arises it is essential that you recognize that this negativity is a counterattack and a response to your insight. You may not realize that it is such. The negativity may come in some other form. But please reflect on the process that you're engaged in, and you will see that its source is from the reflections that you've made. You must then return to your goal no matter what, no matter how you feel, if you are able to do this, the counterattack will lose its power over your life and perhaps forever. Stage six, repeat all the above. The inner adversary is a part of human life. Problems and blocks will inevitably arise. Therefore, true success is not the freedom from problems, but the willingness to continue in the process of confronting and learning from our blocks after successfully using this method and seeing its benefits, it is essential that you continue on the, this path and hopefully share your wisdom with others. The cycle of confronting blocks and pursuing higher goals is one that leads on a spiral path towards infinite growth, a higher level of growth. By going through this process, you will discover that there is a greater power of providence that governs life. You will see directly that our personal blocks do not limit us, but that the essence of the human soul is beautiful and good. The task of life is then to cultivate the light of this goodness. Once you've discovered the way the inner adversary works against you, then you have to use that knowledge to bring in this higher light. This light is the power and quality that you gave up in the past. We reclaim this light by being sincere and courageous in the pursuit of our goals and ideals. Strive to express the light you discover within you in every aspect of your life and in all your relationships. Change. Personal growth is a path from darkness to light. This path is painful because it is a journey from what we know into the unknown. To go beyond our knowledge and experience is fearful, and therefore the path demands courage and faith. We are not our roles and mass, that is, our limits. What are we? If we do not play our roles in life as we were taught to do, how will friends and family relate to us, love us? If we return to the peak states from the past, won't we encounter the same fear and threat that we experienced in the past, the threat of rejection and exile from the family? All these questions are essential. 
in order to return to our natural state of being, to regain our full talents and expression, and to enjoy these peak states of mind, we inevitably must face the same threat and fear we experienced in the past. The path to reclaiming our true selves demands courage and faith. We must trust in the good that directs all life. The price for not changing is a heavy one, as I would like to describe in the following story. In the year 2000, Al Gore ran for president against George Bush. Gore was an incumbent vice president with one of the most successful presidencies in history, and a country enjoying remarkable economic prosperity. Despite Clinton's scandals, Gore had all the ingredients for an easy victory. However, Bush led him in the race by a strong margin after the Republican convention. Gore made a remarkable comeback and seemed to have the momentum to pull strong victory. There was one issue that confronted him. It was not one of policy or his political record, it was a personality quality. The American people found his personality too stiff. At this point, it seemed as if the country wanted Gore, but also wanted him to change. The media made a very big issue of this, and at this point, as if the entire election seemed to turn on this issue. I happened to see an interview with Gore in which a reporter asked him about the issue of his personality and what he intended to do to establish a better relationship with the American people. His response was direct. He said something like this, I am who I am, and the American people can take me or leave me. His attitude was one that expressed an unwillingness to change. In my opinion, it was this attitude that cost Gore the election. He possessed a personal limitation in the way he expressed himself, and the American people saw it. An election can be compared to a relationship. Gore was the groom, and the American people were the bride. The bride said, I like you, but you need to be a little warmer. The groom refused, and the marriage was canceled. The remarkable thing is that the same thing happened eight years earlier. George Bush Sr. was also the vice president to one of the most popular presidents of all time. During his term as president, Bush presided over the Iraq war and the resurgence of America's pride in its military. But during the re-election, the United States was in a recession and Bush was considered indifferent to the people's suffering. When questioned about this in an interview, Bush did not use the opportunity to express concern. He got angry that the people felt that way about him. Once again, I think that this is the reason that he lost the election. He was unwilling to express an emotional quality that the American people were crying out to see in their leader. Politics is controversial and you may not agree with my reading of these events. What is most important is the principle. Life gives people the opportunity to succeed. In order to succeed, we have to have the willingness to address our limitations and blocks and have the courage to change. The price ref for refusing to change is failure. Excuses. There are many excuses that we can give for not changing, but they can all be reduced to essentially one that is illustrated by the following story. It is a modern adaptation of a true story that occurred a few hundred years ago. A man named Bob once came to a great spiritual leader for some counseling on a practical problem he was having in his life. The counselor discussed the issue and explained to Bob that he needed to have more faith and to realize that all is for the good. Everything is guided by divine providence, said the spiritual leader to Bob. What he had to do was clear, but still Bob said it was too difficult. I can't believe all these terrible problems I'm facing are guided by divine providence. And the only and the only and the only answer you have for me is that I should take on these great challenges with faith, that all is for the good. I'm sorry, I can't do it. The counselors replied, you can't or you won't. Bob returned to his car thinking about the discussion, still firm in his mind about what he had said. As he was approaching his car, a man with an old broken down car called to him and said, my friend, would you help me please? I have a flat tire and I need some assistance. Bob looked at the old man and the disheveled man with his hands filled with grease and he said, I'm sorry, I can't. The man by the car replied, you can't or you won't. Those words struck Bob like lightning and he returned to a spiritual counselor to tell him he was ready to take on the challenge. The simple difference between I can't and I won't sums up the entire strategy of the inner adversary. 
It is the difference between ability and will. The inner adversary persuades us that we cannot, which means that we don't have the ability. The question, you can't or you won't, asks us to evaluate the truth of the statement. The question is the expression of the voice of providence. You don't have the ability. You don't have the ability? Or is it that you are, you are refusing to do what needs to be done? That is, to exercise your will. When we reflect and penetrate into the truth of life, most key issues depend ultimately on the simple choice to exercise our will to act. So when your personal blocks confront you, ask yourself, you can't or you won't, and know that you can. If you want, you do. If not, not. Too many people are trapped in their habits. But if they truly want to, they can easily overcome them. A quote by Rebbe Nachman. Chapter 7. Deeper Implications. The Meaning of Success. The aim of pursuing goals is to help you get beyond your limits. Our lives are defined by our limits. Our goals and dreams envision a life beyond them. They are like windows that allow us to peek out over the walls that encircle us, so that we can see beyond our borders to distant lands and places to which we can travel. Imagine a person living in a small town. If she has no vision of what is beyond, then she will never venture out of her borders. But if she hears or learns about cities and countries beyond the walls of her town, places where other interesting people, sights, and experiences exist, she will gain a desire to travel beyond what is known. If she is trapped within those walls and cannot leave, she will become frustrated and pained by the limits. If she does not think about the mysterious and wonderful places beyond, she is content. But if she maintains her vision and desire, she will be frustrated. The same is true with our goals. The experiences and people in the world beyond the town are like the successes and states of mind we can experience by pursuing and achieving goals. The ideas and methods presented in this book can help people to make the leap beyond their limits, to leap beyond their towns, cities, countries, and continents, and venture to far off galaxies which they never believed they could experience. In fact, the first step beyond the walls of the known limits can be as monumental as moving from one's town to journey in a rocket ship into outer space. It is a leap into a different dimension, from the dimension of restriction into the dimension of freedom. Many people have given up on their goals and dreams. They have been persuaded and convinced that the walls to their own towns are too high and too strong. And so they live shut up within the city walls and within the comfort of the constricted habitations they have made for themselves. But in truth, there is no reason to despair. The leap we are describing has been experienced by people who have suffered from the complete range of human problems, physical, psychological and spiritual. People with dyslexia have discovered that they can read. Cancer patients have gone into remission and mentally ill people have recovered their health. All sorts of people with self-doubt and personal inhibitions who have felt restricted in intelligence, creativity, love, happiness, sobriety, sobriety, clarity, and energy have gone on to achieve their dreams, earning university degrees, achieving successful careers, accomplishing creative success, establishing healthy relationships. They've achieved what they and the people around them believe to be impossible. Through the practice of goal-directed personal growth, people gain a realization and experience that the truth of their lives is beyond the limits of who and what they think they are. This is an experience of a genuine kind of enlightenment. It is what Plato described in his famous allegory of the cave. In this story, Plato describes prisoners who have lived their entire lives chained in a cave looking at a wall. On this wall, shadows are cast from a fire that is burning above and behind the prisoners. Since the prisoners have only seen shadows all their lives, they believe that the shadow Im images are reality. Plato then describes the path of releasing one of the prisoners from his seat in the cave. At first, the cave dweller is resistance and does not want to leave his place. He also does not want to see the light 
because it hurts his eyes. When he is dragged out of the cave, it is even more painful. The process of becoming adjusted to the light is a slow one that comes in stages, but eventually he comes to see the light of the truth of day. This allegory is true to the path we take in goal-directed personal growth. Through these reflections, we are able to discover that in our past, we consciously accepted false beliefs, shadows, as true. Consequently, the acceptance of these false beliefs limited the way we function and exist in the world. On the path to discovering this, there is resistance and pain. But once our mind's eye becomes adjusted to the light of truth, we see our former state to be like an imprisoned cave dweller among the shadows. One of the most remarkable aspects of this path to personal enlightenment is the discovery of our freedom. Unlike the prisoners, we discover that we consciously accepted our chains, that is, our false, our false beliefs. This is not to say that there was no coercion. In our state as children, we choose from very limited options. If we, we reject what we saw as false, it would probably have been impossible to survive within our families. Therefore, it is nearly inevitable that we do choose our false roles and beliefs, our part in the family drama. The key point, however, is that there is choice. Although the power to choose to reject the family's belief structure did not exist for all practical purposes, this is not a re reasonable option. The significance of the power to choose, however, is vital for our present. Although it would be practically impossible to act differently in the past, we have not only the power to choose, but the freedom and opportunity to reject what is false in our present life. One of the most beautiful aspects of this kind of work is the discovery of our genuine freedom. When we experience our lives bound by our negative and self-defeating patterns, blocked from our goals, we feel like prisoners to forces we don't know or understand. The recollection of the actual moments when we consciously took on these false beliefs and negative patterns provides us a view into the depths of our very psyches, a behind-the-scenes view where we can discover that the power behind the curtain is really us. And yet we live in such a way that our own power and freedom is actually hidden from our everyday awareness. Once this is discovered, everything changes. We discover that we are creating and setting up our own blocks in life. This realization is astounding and mystifying to experience. Its implication is liberating because it means we are generally free to change. Nothing is stopping us. The power of freedom is what distinguishes humans from all their beings. It also separates us from the limits of the natural world because by definition there is no freedom in the physical world. Animals and plants do not choose the lives and functioning of the, of the mineral plant and animal kingdoms are all determined by natural law. Animals do not deliberate, they act according to instinct. One of the great questions of Western philosophy is do human beings have freedom or is our life determined by the laws of the natural world? This is a question because in a realm that is governed by law such as nature, there's no choice. Physical objects do not have a choice in how they move through space. Their motions are governed by the laws of physics. If human being, if human beings are just physical creations, creatures in a physical world, then the philosopher asks, isn't he determined by physical laws as well? <clears throat> the answer to this question cannot be reached through looking at life from outside of our own experience. We can discover our freedom when we see that we can break out beyond the limits of the forces that bind us to restricting patterns. When we discover our freedom to break out beyond our limits, we actually discover our power in the universe as co-creators of life. A creator is one who is not limited by anything. Nothing determines his or her choices. That is pure creativity. Human beings have a share in this pure power of creativity. This is because human life is not limited by the physical. The scientific models we have for understanding the mind and human life, however, are all based on the laws of the physical world. The physical world is by definition finite. It is a world of limits. Psychology is a medical science, and as such, it is based on the principles of that science, which are physical. The human soul and our mind, despite what some scientific authorities wish to tell us, are not physical. Therefore, 
human life cannot be fully understood by a physical science. Because these sciences are based on the axioms of physical science, they cannot ascend to an appreciation of the infinite freedom, intelligence, justice, and power for healing that human life possesses. The remarkable growth beyond normal limits that is experienced by those who have gone through the process of goal-directed personal growth cannot be understood or even accepted by the physical sciences because it transcends their limits. Human beings are connected to the infinite. Infinite goodness and intelligence guides the universe and every detail of our lives. Our souls are the link between the infinite source of life and the finite physical dimension that science studies. Because we live in a physical world, the infinite power of goodness and intelligence from above manifests itself here below in a way that is constricted and limited. In the natural world, we do not see intelligence and goodness, but it is not a pure and perfect expression of those qualities. I think I made a mistake. Let me repeat that. In the natural world, we do see intelligence and goodness, but it is not a pure and perfect expression of these qualities. It is mixed with what appears chaotic and sometimes bad. The light of truth and goodness that comes from above is similar to pure physical light. In itself, pure light is not seen because it is no color. It is only when that light is reflected from the physical objects that we perceive in the limited form of particular color. Pure light itself contains all the spectrum of colors in a unity. Physical objects absorb some of that light and the part that is reflected is what we perceive as color. In the same way, we do not perceive pure goodness and truth. The light of God's providence that directs all things for the good must be perceived as it is absorbed and reflected in the human drama of the earthly world. Our task is to try to see that even in these dramas and amidst all their colors, that is the particular emotional ups and downs we experience, there exists an expression of the pure light of truth and goodness. We do this through the process of reflecting upon, meditating, and analyzing the events of our lives. Through the process of reflection, we can look at our life and discover that there truly is a source of goodness and intelligence that guides our lives. When we return back to our lives, this awareness becomes a source of personal power to strive towards truth. We pursue goals that are good and we use our intelligence and life force to get them. However, our human powers are thwarted by inner blocks that are created from dramas within our past. Although these dramas created our limitations and blocks, these dramas are ultimately motivated by good intention and intelligence. Our parents seek to teach us what they have learned and what they believe to be the best. They seek to teach us because they love and care for us. We give up the truth we see and the peak states we experience. That is, we open ourselves up and accept these false teachings because we want to connect with the love and care of our parents. We also realize it is necessary for our survival in the family. Our problems serve a purpose in the past that is necessary, even though they are false. These false teachings are the vessel for the distorted expression of love and care and for truth and justice in the family. But life is just. These problems of childhood are like the shells of seeds that guard us during our time of nurture in the dark underground. As we reach the beginnings of adulthood, we begin to realize that these patterns are limits that are not useful, but instead detrimental. If we seek to go beyond our limits and achieve our goals, life compels us to confront this shell Although the pattern of negativity that we experience are painful and frustrating, they're only a shell, a covering of our true being. Within that shell, our full potential exists, unharmed and unscathed. The challenge of life is to raise the courage to discard the shell so that our lives can be a more pure and healthy vessel for the expression of the truth of our lives. This process of breaking through the shell of the ego is one that is ongoing. There are levels and levels of shells that cover the soul. By going through this process, we inevitably discover that what we are is greater 
than what we think. This begins another kind of growth, the growth into the recognition that our lives are completely and utterly dependent on what is beyond and above us. In other words, we begin to directly experience that there is a source of our lives. We are not independent and separate from the source of life. In truth, our very lives are a kind of expression of our Creator, God. God is the ultimate source of the power that functions through our lives. And in God's great kindness, He extends to us both the life force and the freedom to be co-creators of life. Spirituality and spiritual growth is the path of acknowledging our dependence on our Creator, and with this recognition we realize our obligation to honor and, re and revere Him. This is the highest kind of success. In this success we begin to acknowledge that the source of our success is not me or the I, but that being who is the source of the I. This is a kind of success that never leaves. It brings true joy and reveals that we are connected to all of life and the source of life. To the degree we acknowledge and cultivate this connection, we gain in love and appreciation for our lives. We enter a path of growth, continually taking on greater challenges. We can slowly let go of expectations and appreciate each moment, showing compassion to others. We desire to give back to the world and praise the Creator for the beauty of His work and the infinite kindness that he extends. Thank you for sharing this reading of the first part of The Secret to Achieving Personal Goals. If you are interested in more information about the work of pursuing your personal goals as described in the, this book, Please visit the links below and also if you are interested in purchasing a full copy of the book, 